Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Colleen Harris? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Colleen Harris was born sometime in the early 1940s. As an adult, she married and divorced. Later, she married her second husband, a man named James Batten. They lived on Wilderness Way in Placerville, California. In July 1985, Colleen shot and killed her husband while he was in bed in the master bedroom of their home. After killing him, she called her attorney, then called 911. She told the operator that she thought she shot her husband. Later in that same conversation, Colleen indicated she did not know if she shot him. After being charged with murder, Colleen changed her story and said that she killed James in self-defense after he tried to commit offenses against her. She also accused him of committing offenses against her daughter. Colleen was tried and found not guilty. She took over a successful business that James had built and became wealthy. In 1986, Colleen connected with a man named Bob Harris, who had been her boyfriend in middle school. They married on September 2, 1990. He was Colleen's third husband. They lived in the same house in Placerville, where Colleen had killed her second husband, and they slept in the same master bedroom. I imagine Bob always knew which side of the bed was his, based on the chalk outline. Despite the haunted homicidal habitation horror, the couple had many good years together. They divorced in 2004, but it wasn't due to a failure in the relationship. Colleen wanted to continue receiving survivor benefits from the death of her second husband, the man who she shot. Apparently, she needed to be single to do this. Once she secured her $1,100 a month, she remarried Bob. Nothing says true love like a fraudulent divorce and remarriage. In the summer of 2012, the relationship between Bob and Colleen took a turn for the worse. Bob traveled to Mongolia for his job. When he was there, he met a 34-year-old teacher and doctoral student. They engaged in an extramarital adventure. Colleen learned about the affair when Bob was still in Mongolia, and she was not too pleased. In early September 2012, Colleen started sending text messages to Bob's daughter Pamela about how she was sad, surprised, and angry about the infidelity. In mid-September, Bob returned to the United States, but instead of going directly to his home in Placerville, he went to the Los Angeles home of Pamela. Bob and Pamela traveled together to the Placerville house. Bob was concerned that he was going to share the same fate as Colleen's second husband, James. When Bob and Pamela arrived, Colleen seemed to be quiet, passive, and calm. There was no indication that she was going to be homicidal. Despite this, Bob moved to his cabin at Lake Tahoe. He changed his mailing address as well. In mid-November 2012, Bob temporarily moved back to Placerville to take care of Colleen because she was supposed to have hip replacement surgery. Colleen is the one who talked Bob into moving back in for a short time. Colleen was upset with Bob because he would not give her a definitive answer about their future. Like, was he going to end the affair, live permanently at Lake Tahoe, and did he want to stay married? At Christmas time, Colleen and Bob drove to Los Angeles to visit Pamela. Colleen was extremely angry because Bob was not affectionate, and she found a receipt for a necklace that Bob had purchased for his lover in Mongolia. Bob told Pamela that he intended to move back to Lake Tahoe in early 2013. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On January 5, 2013, Colleen sent a message to Pamela indicating that Bob had just called his affair partner 10 minutes ago. Bob would not talk about the future of the marriage, and Colleen wondered who she was married to. The next day, on January 6, at 6.05 p.m., Colleen's attorney, the same one who represented her after she shot and killed her second husband, James, called 911 to report a dead body at a residence in Placerville. He supplied the address of Colleen's house. 
When the police arrived there, they ordered Colleen out of the house. They asked her what was going on. She told them, I can't talk about it. Right after this, Colleen informed the police that her husband, Bob Harris, was dead inside the master bedroom. He had been shot, and she covered him with a blanket. She also said that Bob was beautiful. The police entered the master bedroom. On the bed, they saw a 12-gauge double-barrel shotgun with a pistol-style grip on a blanket. Under the blanket, they found Bob's body. The shotgun was next to his left leg and out of the reach of his left hand. It's clear that he had been shot in the head. His face was missing. The police reported that his brain, bone matter, and blood were scattered all throughout the room. There were no fingerprints or blood on the weapon. It appeared as though the exterior had been cleaned. The headboard of the bed and the ceiling above Bob's head had also been cleaned. The police found no sign of a struggle inside the house. Colleen told the police that she had no idea what happened to her husband. She had no memory of what happened that day at all. The last thing she remembered was the night before when she removed Christmas decorations and watched a movie. She claimed that she was in a gray fog. The police transported Colleen to a hospital where she did not have any trouble communicating with the staff. She understood their questions, answered them coherently, and did not have any complaints regarding her memory. Colleen had a bright red abrasion on her middle finger. The police asked her what caused it, but she was not able to explain the injury. The police thought that the abrasion was consistent with Colleen having discharged the shotgun. Colleen also had a bruise in the middle of her chest. The police thought this could have been caused by the shotgun as well. The weapon had a pistol-style grip and would have been very difficult for Colleen to control. The recoil of the shotgun could have caused the injury. Colleen was charged with murder on January 9, 2013. At her trial in 2015, she had a miraculous memory improvement. She remembered something about a struggle and fighting over the shotgun. During this altercation, Bob accidentally discharged the weapon, which resulted in his death. Colleen Harris was found guilty of murder in April of 2015. In June of that same year, she was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 50 years. In July of 2022, Colleen Harris died in prison. She was 80 years old. Now moving to my analysis. Colleen Harris maintained her innocence up until the day she died. According to her, Bob's death was a tragic accident. This takes me to the question, was Colleen actually responsible for Bob's death? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Colleen was guilty of murder, starting with the inculpatory factors. In 1985, Colleen shot and killed her second husband while he was in bed. She was acquitted for the murder, but it seems fairly clear that she was actually guilty. Later, she claimed that she only had limited memories, which just happened to support her story of self-defense. In 2013, Colleen's third husband, Bob Harris, ended up being shot in the same house. He was in the same bedroom and was also in bed. Colleen once again claimed to have memory problems and then remembered some details which supported a self-defense narrative. So here we see two shootings that are quite similar. Bob was having an affair and planning on leaving Colleen for good. He had indicated he was afraid of Colleen. Colleen had sustained two injuries consistent with firing the shotgun used to kill Bob. The weapon had been cleaned along with certain areas of the bedroom. It was very difficult to believe that Colleen lost her memory. For example, her memory was fine at the hospital. She met with her attorney in his vehicle outside her residence prior to her attorney calling the police. And after Bob was shot and killed, Colleen drove to San Francisco to the residence of her son, arriving at about 10 a.m. Her son wasn't there, but she entered his house anyway and left Bob's coin collection, Bob's cell phone, and a pistol. As far as the coin collection, she would later say she was just trying to keep it safe. The coin collection was valued somewhere between twenty dollars and $40,000. When Colleen was driving back to Placerville, her vehicle broke down. On her call to roadside assistance, she appeared to speak coherently. In addition to undermining her memory loss claim, this recording contradicts Colleen's claim that she never left her house in Placerville. Colleen claimed that she was not angry at Bob for cheating, but Pamela said that Colleen was angry. 
Colleen had a financial incentive to murder Bob. His net worth was about $1 million. She had proven with her temporary 2004 divorce, the one she did to get the survivor benefits, that she was not above using unscrupulous tactics for money. Moving to the exculpatory factors, there were no witnesses to the shooting, no video. In theory, Bob could have been the one who pulled the trigger. Maybe Colleen was only responsible for cleaning up afterward, and this is why the shotgun was found out of Bob's reach. That's pretty much it for exculpatory factors. When considering all the evidence in this case, do I think that Colleen was guilty of murder? Yes. I think she was guilty of killing Bob Harris, and I think that she was guilty of killing her second husband, James, as well. Although in that case, she managed to escape the consequences. Moving to the next section, here are my thoughts in a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, the evidence of the crime scene did not match Colleen's story. If she was going with the memory loss excuse, why did she clean the room and the shotgun? Also, why did she move valuables to her son's house in San Francisco? If she wanted to stage the scene as if it was a robbery, there was no need to take the items that far away. I think what happened here was that Colleen did not plan the murder very well. Her first plan was probably to shoot Bob and dispose of his body, but when she tried to clean the crime scene, she realized how a point-blank shotgun blast leaves quite a mess. After giving up on her cleaning adventure, Colleen reasoned that she could rely on the same tactic that led to her acquittal in the 1985 shooting death of her second husband. She pretended that her memory was compromised. It never occurred to Colleen that the events surrounding the death of her second husband could be used against her in the murder trial for her third husband. Item number two, one could argue that the failure to convict Colleen of the murder of her second husband paved the way to her murdering her third husband. It boosted her confidence. It made her think that she could get away with the crime. How did Colleen manage to get acquitted when it seems fairly clear that she was guilty? During that trial, James was portrayed as some type of offender. He was never charged with anything like that, but the jury believed it either way. This set up a self-defense claim on the part of Colleen. In addition, the jury believed mental health clinicians who said that Colleen's memory loss was legitimate. One therapist supposedly helped Colleen magically regain her lost memories, which coincidentally reinforced her story of self-defense. In other videos, I've talked about how mental health treatment professionals are not well suited for criminal trials. It's not their fault. Mental health assessment is simply not reliable when applied to someone who might be lying. The clinicians are to blame, however, when they pretend that they can be certain about an evaluation, when they are aware that there is no certainty in the world of mental health. Memory loss is often invoked by criminal defendants, but it's almost never authentic. Memory failures can occur in real life, but the types of memory problems that defendants bring up often involve a narrow range of time disappearing from their memory. That window of time almost always corresponds to when they were allegedly committing the crime. Mental health clinicians don't fall for the memory loss trick as often these days, but in 1985, when Colleen shot her second husband, clinicians were less educated about this topic, and they were much more superstitious. They tended to believe in magic. Unfortunately, some still do today, but again, it's not as common. Item number three, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Colleen murdered her second husband, but escaped responsibility for the reasons I talked about. She probably never intended to murder her third husband, but when he was about to leave her, she decided it was time to give homicide a try. Bob was caught up in the affair. He was very excited about his Mongolian lover. He knew that Colleen was dangerous, yet decided to go to sleep in the same bedroom where Colleen shot and killed her second husband. Colleen took advantage of his unwise move to obtain a permanent separation. Those are my thoughts on the case of Colleen Harris. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.